The first movie with synchronized sound debuted in 1927, birthing what is still very close to our modern notion of what a movie is. You ain't heard nothing. The Hayes Code was implemented in 1934. That means we only had seven short years of uncensored talkies before systemic, nationwide censorship went into effect, which wouldn't be abolished for another 34 years. If you do the math, it wasn't until the year of our Lord 1996 before uncensored cinema had finally been around for longer than censored cinema. That represents a massive gap in creative control that still managed to produce some of the slickest, coolest, and most entertaining flicks of all time. Don't get me wrong, I'm unspeakably grateful for the films we have from this era, but I often wonder what could have been. What would the films of the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s have been like if they hadn't had the Hayes Code restricting what they could and couldn't depict? Probably more blasphemy. Now I know what it feels like to be gone. More nudity. Detailed depictions of criminal activity. Hey, hey that's well, look at me, you can carry it. Come on, let's get out of here. Gay and lesbian representation. Talk of sexual preferences and sexual habits. Truth is that the queen has had 12 lovers this past year. A round dozen. Long live the queen! Sadomasochism. Oh, do it again, I like it. Do it again. May Clark being foxy as hell. Oh, it's just what I wanted. How did he know what you wanted? Ah, maybe I mentioned it, huh? <laughs> all things that are very well represented in the films released before the Hayes Code went into effect, which all but disappeared in the 34 years that followed. Filmmakers still worked very hard to fit these elements into their films, albeit in coded or euphemistic form. That's your idea of a friend? That is my idea of a friend. You must gay life. If there's any lesson to be learned from the Hayes Code, it's that society doesn't always progress in a straight line. There's lots of backpedaling and backsliding while people try to figure these things out. When Hollywood was faced with the prospect of legislative censorship by the government in the late 1920s, they probably figured self-censorship was the best bad idea they had going for them. But it probably didn't help that William H. Hayes, the enforcer of the code, was himself a former government employee who ran the censorship office more as a way to enforce his own personal code of ethics rather than to protect Hollywood from the government. Thankfully, the threat of government censorship solely eroded over the next 30 years, and in 1968, the involuntary Hayes Code was replaced by the voluntary MPAA rating system that's still in use today. In this video, I'm going to outline four instances of Hayes Code era censorship that I find particularly goofy, confusing, emblematic, and sad. Not to make fun of the past, but rather to try and learn as much as we can from it. Number four. The Bride of Frankenstein is a veritable Rorschach test for potential censors. So Bride of Frankenstein is not only my favorite of all the universal horrors, it was also one of the first big tests for the Hayes Code office. Released in 1935, less than a year after the Hayes Code took effect, Bride of Frankenstein featured a literal metric shit ton of content that various countries objected to. And what's more, nearly every single censor who looked at it saw something different that they didn't like. As a result, the film acts as a sort of inkblot test for various national tastes of the mid-1930s. China and England apparently didn't like some of the shots of the monster staring longingly at the bride's inanimate form because it reminded them too much of necrophilia. To which I say... Too much? Japan quite famously objected to a scene in which the evil Dr. Pretorius shows off his body reconstruction abilities by exhibiting tiny people who think they're famous world leaders. Japan's censorship board felt that having Henry VIII chased around by a set of tweezers was, quote, making a fool out of a king. He has his hands full. And as for the Hayes office, for the most part they objected to the film's enthusiastically unremitting digs at organized religion. To a new world. Of gods and monsters. Joseph Breen, lead censor for the Hayes office for much of its existence, and devout Catholic, demanded the deletion of a scene in the script in which the monster comes across a crucifix in a graveyard and tries to save Jesus from the cross. In the final film, they have him topple a statue of a bishop instead. There's also a scene from early in the film in which Dr. Pretorius tries to convince Henry Frankenstein to resume his reanimation experiments, and we get this line. And follow the lead of nature, or of God, if you like your Bible stories. In the original script, he had said, if you like your fairy stories. Oddly enough, there's plenty of religious imagery in the film that the Hayes office didn't object to, probably owing to the fact that mere imagery is much easier to hide, not to mention what some critics have interpreted as a vaguely homosexual subtext that may or may not have been intentionally imparted on the film by director James Whale, which could honestly be the subject of its own entire post. I don't want to hear. I've changed my mind. 
If you've never seen any of the old Universal horrors, I encourage you to give Bride of Frankenstein a chance. Even if you don't think it's one of the most exciting and emotionally affecting films of the 1930s, the trivia game is certainly on point, and I still think it's better than most any other monster movie that gets made today. Seriously, Universal, you've had five tries in eight years to get your dark universe off the ground. It's time to slide into my DMs and listen to my pitch. Number three. The plot of The Big Sleep is nearly incomprehensible because they couldn't actually film anything that the movie was actually about. I can't sit through a screening of The Big Sleep. The plot is famously incomprehensible. There's just too many off-screen reference. Too many people standing in rooms talking about people and events that we haven't seen. Ostensibly, the film is about a private detective who gets embroiled in a complex extortion and murder plot revolving around an underground pornography ring. But because of the Hayes Code, the filmmakers had to do more than just avoid depictions of pornography, they couldn't even mention it. So here's the big moment in The Big Sleep when Humphrey Bogart discovers the pornography ring. You'll note that that girl is notably not naked. Of course, she was naked in the original novel on which the film is based. But the filmmakers weren't allowed to depict any nudity in 1946, so they decided to put her in a kimono and call it a day. Later on, this same woman is blackmailed with some nude photos, but Bogey and Bacall can't refer to any pornography by name, so we get this. She takes a nice picture. Presumably that's a euphemism that people immediately picked up on in 1946, but when I watched this film for the first time in 2010, I had no clue what was going on. As if that weren't confusing enough, in the original novel, Lauren Bacall's character was an accessory to murder, but the filmmakers wanted to make her a good guy for the film so that she could get together with Bogart's character at the end of it, thereby capitalizing on the public's obsession with their real-life marriage. But since the Hayes Code forbade good guys from committing crimes, the filmmakers went ahead and changed the identity of the killer so that Bacall's character was no longer an accessory to murder. But they did it rather sloppily, to the point where the film never actually confirms with 100% certainty who actually killed who. Sometimes, narrative ambiguity is a powerful storytelling tool, but not when it's completely unintentional. If you're gonna watch this one, be sure to have the Wikipedia page open next to you. Number two. Barbara Stanwyck is given the exact opposite life advice in two different cuts of Babyface. Yeah. So Babyface is one of my all-time favorite pre-code Hollywood films. It tells the scandalously lurid tale of a girl who works at her father's speakeasy slash brothel, who takes the opportunity to leave town just as soon as her father dies in an industrial accident. But before she heads off to the big city, a kind-hearted man sits her down and warns her not to use her sexuality to get ahead. A woman, young, beautiful like you are, could get anything she wants in the world. But there is a right and a wrong way. Remember, the price of the wrong way is too great. Go to some big city where you will find opportunities. Don't let people mislead you. You must be a master, not a slave. Be clean, be strong, defiant, and you will be a success. Pretty wholesome, right? Turns out that was the edited version of that speech, written by none other than Joseph Breen himself. The original speech resurfaced in 2004. It's not just different, it's completely antithetical to what audiences saw in 1933. A woman, young, beautiful like you, can get anything she wants in the world because you have power over men. But you must use men, not let them use you. You must be a master, not a slave. Look, here, Nietzsche says, all life, no matter how we idealize it, is nothing more nor less than exploitation. That's what I'm telling you. Exploit yourself. Go to some big city where you will find opportunities. Use men. Be strong. Defiant. Use men to get the things you want. In either version of the movie that you watch, after that speech, Stanwyck heads off to the big city and proceeds to sleep her way to the top. Have you had any experience? Plenty. I'd rather wait in there. I hate crowds. But you can see how either speech can completely recolor the rest of the film. Babyface is a fascinating example of America's complex, often contradictory attitudes towards sex. Hey, is that John Wayne? Oh, 
never see you anymore. I never see anybody anymore. I'm working so hard. Needless to say, everybody should rent this one tonight. You can't look at scenes like these and tell me old black and white movies aren't the shit. Oh, excuse me. My hands shake so when I'm around you. Number one. Roscoe Arbuckle was falsely accused of murder, then acquitted, and then banned from filmmaking. So most millennials probably aren't too familiar with the name Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, but everyone in the 1920s was. Arbuckle was perhaps the most famous actor of the silent film era. He mentored Charlie Chaplin and discovered Buster Keaton, but that's not what he's most famous for. On September 5th, 1921, Arbuckle hosted a party at the St. Francis Hotel in San Francisco which resulted in the death of Virginia Rappé. The undisputed facts of the case are that Rappé was experiencing severe abdominal pain at the party, so the hotel doctor administered a dose of morphine. After lying in the hotel bathroom for several days under the care of a revolving door of friends, hotel staff, and local doctors, she was finally admitted to a maternity hospital and found to have a ruptured bladder, likely caused by chronic cystitis. She died two days later. It was then that one of the partygoers, Bambina Maud Delmont, accused Arbuckle of raping Rappé at the party. Arbuckle had been with Rappé while she was incapacitated at the party, yes, but witnesses said he was only there to assist those who were taking care of her. And when Rappé was asked point blank on at least two separate occasions whether or not Arbuckle had raped her, she said no. Long story short, the charge was completely groundless. Not only was there no physical evidence to support the claim, the defense actually produced a telegram from Delmont in which she expressed an explicit desire to extort money from Arbuckle. As it turns out, Delmont's testimony was so inconsistent that she was never even called upon to testify at the trial. The prosecution suppressed their own witness's testimony. Oh, and for the record, it's not like I tried to find the glummest picture in existence of Bambina Maud Delmont. These are just literally the only two HD pictures I could find of her. Despite the lack of any physical evidence, contradictory statements from Delmont, a lead prosecutor who was known to pressure witnesses into making false statements, and no accusation of wrongdoing from the actual victim, the trial proceedings dragged on for six months, with two juries producing back-to-back -back mistrials. But when the third jury finally went to deliberate, they only took six minutes to come back with a not guilty verdict, and five of those those minutes were spent writing a personal apology to Arbuckle, but by then, the damage was done. On April 18, 1922, six days after Arbuckle's acquittal, newly appointed head of the MPPDA, William H. Hayes, banned Arbuckle from working in U.S. films. The ban was lifted eight months later, but by then it was too late to save Arbuckle's career. He never worked regularly again, and he died in his sleep in 1933 at the age of 46. But someone's career had just begun. Roscoe Arbuckle, who, by the way, didn't like the nickname Fatty, left behind a truly amazing legacy, evident not only in his own films, but also in the films of Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. If you've never seen a Keaton, or a Chaplin, or an Arbuckle, I highly recommend them. The fact that they're silent doesn't make them boring, it just means that the creators of these movies knew how to generate jokes and drama and irony through the use of pictures. And I don't think that's something that should ever go out of fashion. timing of this video, in which I defend a Hollywood heavy hitter accused of sexual assault, might seem a little weird. In fact, I had already started production on this vlog several weeks before Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey, Louis C.K., etc., etc., were all publicly exposed as sexual abusers by some very brave accusers and some very hardworking journalists. Please don't misunderstand me. What I'm railing against here isn't rape allegations, obviously, but rather the silencing of the innocent. Back in 1921, they were doing it to Roscoe Arbuckle, and today they're doing it to the countless victims of sexual abuse who are threatened, gaslighted, and litigated into silence by their attackers. Not that they weren't doing that back in 1921 as well. Lest we forget, the Arbuckle scandal had two victims. There was Arbuckle himself, and Virginia Rappé, who died in agony over the course of an entire week, her pleas for proper care going largely ignored by the many physicians who examined her. In the century since Rappé was silenced, we, as a society, have only barely begun to listen. I'd also like to make clear, since we were talking about boycotts, that I've got no problem with these guys never working another day in Hollywood ever again. And if you honestly can't figure out how I can condone boycotts in the cases of Harvey Weinstein, Louis C.K., and Kevin Spacey, but not in the case of Roscoe Arbuckle, then there isn't enough time on the NSEA protector to explain it to you. Personally, I'm not about to throw out my copies of Glengarry Glen Ross, k Pax, and Seven just yet, if only because those movies are the products of thousands of minds that aren't Kevin Spacey. But it's okay if you are. And personally, I don't think I'll ever be able to revisit, say, House of Cards ever again. I can't watch Kevin Spacey play sexual predator. Nope. 
never again. I really appreciate those of you who are willing to listen to me talk about all this stuff. Lord knows, these news stories have not been easy to follow, even for the good guys. Perhaps especially for the good guys. It does me good to talk all this through, and I hope it does you good to listen. Feel free to talk back. You can write me a message in the comments, and be sure to follow me on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram, if you want. I can't promise I'll be able to respond to everybody, but I do plan to at least read everything that you guys write. In semi-related news, this vlog recently passed 21,000 subscribers, and my Patreon hit its first goal of $50 a month within just three weeks of going live. There is no possible way that I can adequately thank you all for your continued attention and support. I've always got more content coming down the pipe. Some of you will even get to vote on my next video through Patreon. But until then, let's all go watch some movies that make us obscenely happy. It's not time to make a change. Just sit down, take it slowly. You're still young, that's your fault. There's so much you have to go through. Excuse me.